Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Pat Flynn Show. Really, really excited for this roundtable conversation. I have two of just my, my favorite guests that I've had on this podcast uh, before, Dr. Gavin Kerr, Dr. Joshua Rasmussen. Now, this is the first time that you two are interacting, but I mean, I've had conversations with both of you many times, and um, uh, I really do mean it. Two of my favorite people to talk to, so, so very excited to, to have us all together here, and I want to thank you both for taking the time to be here. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor. Yeah. yeah. So I was thinking, you know, um, both of you have, uh, you know, um, been involved heavily in philosophy of religion and uh, thinking about the nature of ultimate reality and God, but you kind of take slightly different approaches. So I thought it might be fun to kind of talk about the different approaches to God and see uh, some of the similarities and, and, and differences and, and maybe uh, advantages and disadvantages and, and even in just conversation and facilitating understanding. But then Gavin and I were actually talking uh, earlier today, Josh, about something I know that you've thought about and worked on, and that's this idea of the of the gap problem, right? And and very quickly, the gap problem arises uh, in relation to some arguments for God, uh, which which have kind of like a stage one, and stage one is trying to get uh, to some type of like uncaused or unconditioned or necessary reality, and then the gap kind of comes in there of of trying to to show why this this uh, could be or must be. Uh, God is as traditionally understood. And I was telling Gavin, I'm like, oh, well, this is convenient time to talk about this because this is something that Josh, Josh thinks about, right? Mm. Um, so maybe we could just open the, the, the conversation, conversation there um, and just kind of talk about the different approaches. Uh, I know this is the first time that you guys have engaged with one another. So mm. wherever it goes, it goes as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Well, I'd be very curious, Gavin, to hear kind of how you approach it. I'm not familiar with your uh, strategies or, you know, how you think about it. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. Gavin, is the, mm. is the gap problem really, is it a problem for, for your approach? Why don't you give us your general sketch mm. of, of, uh, uh, and I know you've done yeah. it on the podcast before, but let's just assume that that's never been said and then we'll just mm. jam from there. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so I, I suppose, I mean, what, what I'm discovering more and more, um, and what I'm finding out more and more, the more I engage with, uh, critics of Thomism and people who, who approach philosophy of religion as a field rather than you know making claims which would find their way into philosophy of religion but their claims which occur in metaphysics or epistemology mm -hmm. is that um the thomist approach to the existence of god and the approach that i've defended previously is that we demonstrate god's existence as a piece of metaphysical reasoning and what i mean about that is that um, when we do metaphysics, when we try and think through the nature of being and what it is to be, we end up affirming a primary cause of being. We're led to affirm that. Um, this happens classically in Aquinas' thoughts, something I've engaged with quite a bit. Um, when Aquinas makes the distinction between essence and existence, and he considers high essence and existence relate to each other um, mm -hmm. as potency and act. So um, existence is the principle of actuality by which any essence exists. And then he, he puts that into a causal context such that insofar as um, existence is not a result of the intrinsic nature of the thing, it doesn't flow from a thing's essence because if the essence, you know, give, given the distinction of essence and existence, the essence doesn't even exist in order for existence to flow from it. It must yeah. be a result of some extrinsic principle. And then Thomas feeds that into his whole metaphysics of per se ordered series, which is such that the members of those series, they don't uh, possess essentially the causality of the series in question um so that unless there is some cause in which they can participate which does have the causality of the the series per se or essentially they would be without the causality in question and so existence um as a kind of causality is locatable in per se ordered series and so we're, we we terminate in a primary cause which is pure existence itself um, that's generally the strategy that Thomas takes. That's the strategy he takes in the day into Essentia. More generally, um, he, he's thinking about actuality, which is the actuality rooted in existence, but in different sort of arguments. He's just thinking about, you know, actuality per se, such as in the first, second, um, third, fourth, and I would suggest, suggest fifth ways. Um, arguments from the De Potentia, from the commentary on the sentences, um, even from his commentary in John's Gospel, all of those. He, he's thinking about actuality, but it's actuality rooted in um, existence. And that's the general Thomist approach to God. But what I've been finding is that a lot of people who engage in philosophy of religion as a field mm -hmm. um, seem to presume that we come to arguments for God's existence uh, on the basis of a kind of a neutral approach 
that any premise which is found within an argument for God's existence has to be treated neutrally and not read within the context of a background metaphysics. Um, now, this isn't something I'm attributing to you, Josh. Um, it's, yeah. it's with other people that I've been engaged with, uh, particularly critics of Aquinas, who hold that um, we, can't, we, we, we can't read arguments for God uh, uh, within a background metaphysics. And so they throw in these problems such as, existential inertia you know it's been a big one at the minute that we have to remain neutral on the existential inertia issue whereas in aquinas it's just it's not even an issue because it's an impossibility given the thomas metaphysics some other objections you know to say the first way i've been reading and one of them has been you know the gap argument and the gap argument you know is you know how do we get you know from a primary mover or an unmoved mover to god well, if, you know, something like the first way is read, you know, within that metaphysical backdrop, that what's at stake here is actuality, and an unmoved mover is that which is responsible for just actuality per se, then an unmoved mover is actual, okay, because it, uh, it, it's a mover, and so it brings about the actuality of on other things, but it's not itself caused in its actuality because it's an unmoved mover. So given that, then what we have is something which is just pure actuality and and if it's pure actuality then it can't be any sort of you know naturalistic thing or some sort of just aristotelian first mover which still needs its you know motivation for moving explained and so on and so forth and in other words what we have is we have an independent primary source of all that is so um there isn't really a gap there because once we get to a primary source for all that is we have a creator and then we can we can start doing uh, you know what comes after that, which is you know think about what would it be like for this thing to be you know source of all that is pure actuality, and then we deduce the divine attributes. But at least with the conclusion from the argument, we have a source without which there would be nothing. Um, and so we're at uh, I would claim we're at we're at God already with that, and a gap I don't think opens up there. That would tend to be the Thomist approach to the matter, so that. You know, whenever the sort of the, the issue of the gap argument, for instance, comes up, the Thomas kind of just thinks, well, why is that an issue? It's not an issue for us, um, given the metaphysics that we build into this argument. Uh -huh. what, what do you make of that approach, Josh? Yeah, no, it's interesting because it seems like there's maybe two parts to the approach. So one part is the argument uh, for this kind of purely actual thing and then teasing out its attributes based on this background metaphysics. So there's mm. the argument. And then there's this kind of maybe epistemology. Um, and it's interesting because Gavin, while you're talking, I was thinking about a sort of problem that I see in the dialectic and the conversations between those who might sort of externalize their view and sort of treat it as the objective uh, third person proof. It's like mm -hmm. every rational person must believe this versus a kind of first person uh, approach where you just sort of ask yourself, well, does this seem true to me, given my background considerations, my concepts. And, and if it seems true to me, then it might rationally move me to a conclusion, mm. even if it doesn't have to rationally move others. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I almost actually wonder if, if your um, distinction between those who would sort of be thinking of it um, as neutral steps versus mm -hmm. those who might recognize that, well, there's background uh, packages in play that are, that mm -hmm. are part of it. I was actually wondering if, if that might even intersect or, or um, come to sort of the same thing that I, I was thinking about, but just mm -hmm. in different terms. Mm -hmm. Because here, here's a worry, and I'd be curious to hear what both of you guys think about this. A worry that I hear sometimes that people express, I think this is a legitimate worry, is they would feel like somebody who's coming up with an argument is sometimes kind of presenting it so confidently, like this is a proof and, and I've heard this specifically as a criticism of Thomists, that Thomists are saying, we have a metaphysical demonstration of God's existence. And it sort of sounds like now, in order for you to be rational, you have to agree with us. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then sort of what I hear some of the skeptics saying is like, but wait a minute, like I, I don't share your intuitions or I, I don't buy into your metaphysics. If, if we look at this as a neutral, uh, you know, agnostic who isn't already in your metaphysics, I don't have to be persuaded. And then you might come back and say, yeah, my, my point is not that you, anybody has to be persuaded. It's that if you share these background uh, metaphysical systems and you find them plausible and you might find them plausible after wrestling with them or coming into them, 
at, uh, at a certain length of time. Oh, well, you might not though. So you're not, you're not claiming that you must, you know, that then you have kind of a, a gentler approach where you're just saying, here's how things seem to me. They don't have to seem this way to you. What do you mm. think about that as kind of like an epistemology of approaching these arguments? Yeah. Um, so, um, two things I would want to say there. The first thing I would want to say is that from my point of view in, in presenting what I would say is a demonstration of God's existence. And so I, I would want to say that it is a proof. I don't want to say that for somebody who isn't convinced of that proof, they're irrational and they can have no rational um, contribution to the debate. I yeah. know that Graham Oppie has taken issue with some people who have said that, that uh, an atheist, you know, has no rational engagement here because they don't accept the conclusion of the proof. I don't want to say yeah. that because I think um, being rational and irrational doesn't pertain to um, accepting the conclusion of a demonstration. Rather, I, I think I think it's uh, it, it pertains to, you know, um, follow, following one's reasons uh, uh, and seeing where those reasons go. Now, one could just be misguided in the premises that one takes to be true. Um, but I mean, that's a different issue that that's a matter, you know, of, you know, grasping, you know, the truth of a set of premises. That's, I think that's distinct from being reasonable or rational about something. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the first thing I want to say. So somebody who doesn't accept the conclusion, um, I'm not saying that they're being irrational. I would just say that they're wrong. Um, I, I want to hear the second thing. I also <laughs> want to come back and hear a little more about what you mean by demonstration. Right. Okay. Um, so the, the second thing then is, um, I think that, you know, in metaphysics, we can make demonstrations and, you know, this is what you want to chat about. So we'll, we'll get chatting about that, that we can make demonstrations and that we can arrive at the truth of the matter in metaphysics, um, usually requires an awful lot, you know, of back and forth. Um, but I think that can be done. And um, I think that when we do that, then we can get um, demonstrations for God's existence. If somebody disagrees, then I think instead of the, the, the person disagreeing, asking, you know, oh, well, how do you demonstrate and how does this, that or the other happen? I would actually just want to see where the disagreement is. You know, if we yeah. both accept that we can engage in a rational conversation, let's not engage in a rational conversation about the, you know, the, the meta philosophy or the philosophy of philosophy. But, you know, let's just get into the nitty gritty of the argument and see where the, see the where the, is. which premise is yeah. the, is, yeah, that makes no, sense. I, do, I mean, I do have, you know, sort of thoughts about the philosophy of philosophy and, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the nature of metaphysics and how we make demonstrations, which, you know, you want to get into. But I mean, part of it, well, I I'd be curious just to know what, what you mean, like what, what does the word demonstration mean? Okay. So, I mean. I take demonstration just in, you know, well, the, the paradigm case, I think, is the Aristotelian syllogism. Um, okay. We have two tr true premises, um, which when fed into, you know, the, the proper logic of the syllogism leads to a conclusion. Um, I think that's the ideal type of demonstration that we can have. I mean, I think we can have all other demonstrations as well. You know, we can have inductive inferences um, so long as we have a good account for, you know, how we get over, you know, the problem of induction or so long as we don't accept, you know, an empiricist account of an in induction that we, you know, retain yeah. a more sort of moderate, you know, even critical realist sort of view of how we know, know the essences or the natures of things in the world. I think we can you know, make inductive generalizations given that we can have, well, I, I would argue we can have an insight into the nature of things. Um, and so it, if we can make these inductive inferences, you know, form premises on the basis of those, and then, you know, by deduction, um, arrive at a conclusion, I think we can form those set, sorts of demonstrations in metaphysics. Mm -hmm. That would be the ideal kind of demonstration for me. Yeah, well, that makes sense. I, I think may, maybe the reason why I'm curious about this and what I sort of see at stake maybe is certain stumbling blocks of the argument based on presentation. So I was just thinking like, sometimes I've heard people say that, you know, Professor Rasmussen has made a mistake uh, and we can demonstrate his mistake. Mm. And that feels different to me than when they say, uh, you know, Professor Rasmussen's argument has a premise and I actually don't find that premise intuitive, but Professor Rasmussen says he, he finds it intuitive. So we have a kind of a, a disagreement over um, whether that premise is true, but we both, both parties are in a sense justified from their own perspective. Mm. And it, it feels like if I say, and, and I'm not disagreeing with, with your proposal that there are demonstrations. Pat and I have talked about this. Pat, I think you might remember 
one of the first things you asked me about my argument was whether I thought it was a demonstration that it actually right. counted. I don't know if you remember that. I do. I do. You remember that? And, I, and I've thought about that question actually since then, because because I, I've wondered, well, what do I mean by demonstration? And, and I, Josh, I remember you, you specifically said like there's there, there came a moment for you where you just saw right you you yeah. saw with for, from your perspective with from my perfect, perspective from with perfect clarity that this and you were i think you're pretty strong in your in your case that this that this had to be the case like it was yeah. a very um yeah and, and that you know uh, whatever you want to call that that sounded kind of like a yes to my question in a way right? yeah yeah and so so then i thought maybe we could characterize it this way so a demonstration would be uh, a sequence of steps where it's possible to see the truth of each of the steps um, may, maybe there could be a degree of clarity and, and some of those things that seemed perfectly clear at one time, like I can lose that clarity because I'm not thinking about it. Then I have to come back and, and may, maybe it, it becomes clear again, you know, um, do you have to have perfect clarity? So uh, lo, let me just give an example. I think kind of helps to illustrate this and we can come back to the gap problem. Mm -hmm. I was actually thinking earlier today, I was talking with my wife, Rachel, we talked about philosophy. I was talking about how there are certain cases where it seems like very clear that one thing implies another. And then other cases, maybe it's not so clear, but the structure of reasoning is the same. And so I was using the example of a square circle. And I asked my wife, I, I said, Rachel, is a square circle impossible? And, and she said, yeah, that's impossible. I said, well, why? How do you know that? And so we talked about that for a while. And ultimately what she said was that it entails a contradiction. But then my question was, how do you know it entails a contradiction? Because being square and being circular isn't itself in the form of A and not A. Uh, now you might say, well, being circular implies not having four sides and being square implies having four sides, but it's not even part of the definition of being a circle. Not having four sides is not part of the definition. Mm -hmm. Rather not having four sides follows from the definition, okay? So there's this sort of principle of reason by which you can just see that if there were a square circle, then there would be a contradiction. And then an additional principle of reason by which I think you can just see that a contradiction can't be true. Then you put those principles together and you can just see that there can't be a square circle. Now, I trust that like probably everybody who's watching this, whether they believe in God or not, will probably grant that um, if anything counts as a demonstration, this counts as a demonstration, that there can't be square circles. It's proof by contradiction. Okay. However, and I think this might serve your thought, Gavin, if I'm understanding it that this doesn't imply that you would be irrational if you disagreed with the demonstration. Because, I mean, there are all sorts of, I, I was reviewing a, a, a manuscript for Oxford University Press where they were making an argument for fictionalism with respect to any truths about abstracta. And so I think applying their, their argument, they might have reason to be skeptical even about this inference. And they would say it's, it's, it's actually false it would be true given certain metaphysical assumptions or semantic assumptions. So there's a way in which you can become skeptical, even of something that maybe would be this clear. So then translating this over to an argument for God, maybe what we could say is that um, you might think there's a demonstration for God if you think that it's possible to be clear that each premise is true. Maybe this is just another way of saying it's possible to know that each premise is true. Mm. Yeah, you what know. do you think about that, Gavin? Does that seem um, fair? So what, one, of, one of the thoughts w that was occurring to me, I, mean, I would have my own thoughts about, you know, the squared circle uh, business, but may maybe one of the things I would like to draw you out on, uh, Josh. Uh, are yeah. you happy with Josh? Um, yeah, yeah. You, sorry, because I know we've I'm just calling met. you Gavin, so it's only yeah. fair. Oh, you can call <laughs> me Gav. Gav's fine as well. Oh, okay. Um, um, so... How much that, that clarity that you talk about, how much is that r response dependent? In other words, is it clarity for the the um, the, the reasoner uh, who is reasoning his way through the demonstration? Is it that he needs to be clear? Yes. Or is it that the steps of the demonstration have to be clear regardless oh. of whether the reasoner grasps their clarity? Okay, good. Very. Uh, that's a very powerful question. Yeah. So here, here's my view. And I, and I could be wrong. So I, I feel a little bit nervous just to say this because I don't have a, a full We're just, we're just but... having fun here. I love exploring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 and if, and if I moved off- We don't have to be committed to anything here. If I moved great. off the view, you know, I guess I shouldn't be nervous. That should be a mm -hmm. great experience, you know. Mm -hmm. um, 
my view would be that clarity is always relative to a person. So that if you, if you talk about a proposition being like intrinsically clear, I would say there's no such thing. It, I would want to translate that. I would say it's clear because most people who think about it find it clear. Um, and I understand I've, I've read of philosophers who say, no, there's a kind of clarity inside the proposition, sort of a, a self-evidence, but I, I translate that. So I don't think clarity is um, in the proposition. I think it's always person relative. What do you think? Um, my concern there is that it makes the subject or you know, it makes the person entertaining the proposition the measure of the intelligibility of the yeah. proposition. Um, my worry there then is that um, the proposition itself or the intelligibility that it expresses um, is not the measure of our thought about it. Uh, and so- What do you mean by intelligibility there? Um, okay, so uh, whenever you know, we, we're in a state of knowing, uh, whenever we characterize a state as a state of knowing, it's one that involves some sort of a normative or conceptual content. Yeah. Um, so when I think um, about something in the world and I'm in a state of you know, knowing that thing, uh, my conceptual content allows me to pick out that thing as opposed to other things. Mm -hmm. But that conceptual content, because I'm not an idealist, that conceptual content is not a content that I create or that I you know, uh, bring about. It's a conceptual content which the, um, the object brings about in me and it brings okay. it about because it, it has an intelligible nature. It has an essence. Um, so, I mean, translated okay, that, into that, that. That helps, that helps. So yeah, so I would mm -hmm. agree that things can be intelligible mm -hmm. in that sense, mm -hmm. uh, apart from my awareness mm -hmm. or anybody's awareness. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might think God is aware of everything, but that's, mm -hmm. that's not really to, to the point. So mm -hmm. uh, it's sort of intrinsically intelligible. Mm -hmm. But then there's a question of whether the truth of the proposition about it is clearly true and whether that clarity is internal to the proposition. So this is where I think maybe, you know, um, we get into some of these epistemological issues that you said you're working on and that I'd like to get yeah. talking to you about. Because if the paradigm of knowledge is propositional, um, so if the paradigm of knowledge is knowledge that P, um, mm -hmm then I think we're into problems because I would, I would contest that the content of a state of knowing is always propositional content. I'm with I, you. I, I can allow for non-conceptual knowledge by acquaintance. Oh, no, I can't allow for non-conceptual, you know, content oh, thought, of any kind. Oh, because it's not content. Um, it, well, yeah, exactly. I, so I, I thought you were saying that you, you want there to be uh, propositional knowledge and non-propositional knowledge. Yeah, non-propositional yet conceptual. Yeah, content. conceptual. Oh, oh, okay. Um, so, I don't think there's any content which is okay. non-conceptual. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think the conceptual is unbounded, um, so that when we come into contact with an object in the world, um, it engages or it brings into operation certain conceptual episodes, um, mm -hmm. and then. At, at the ultimate extreme, at the level of judgment, we, you know, assent to some proposition. But prior to that, um, we're dealing with uh, conceptual content all the way down, right down to experience. What about arguments? Would you say that those are built out of propositions? Um, I, I, in order to have an argument, yes, you have to, you know, have propositions, which, yeah. you know, are presented for, you know, assent in, in judgment. Yeah. Well, so I'm, I'm thinking... If we're talking about a demonstration, dem I think of it, this is sort of my terminology. I think a demonstration mm -hmm. is an argument and an argument is a set of propositions. Mm -hmm. And so then I'm thinking that in order for a proposition to be clear, mm -hmm. it's got to be clear to someone. Mm -hmm. So two plus two equals four is clear if it's clear to someone. Mm -hmm. Now, some propositions are sort of maybe easy mm -hmm. uh, for them to be clear to like most human beings, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and some are more difficult. And so sort of the, the way that I think of different proofs is uh, the reason why some of them are more controversial than others more has to do with sort of the ease by which, well, a few different reasons. One has to do with the ease by which human beings can get clear. Another reason is because there can be high stakes and there can be very mm. polarized um, psychological forces, especially in politics. I mean, there are things I think you can get clear. It doesn't have to be that hard, but uh, 
when the stakes are high mm. and people who make certain arguments are your enemy, it yeah. can be difficult. Mm. You know, just to just to bring it back down. Um, by the way, I'm, this is super fascinating stuff. I really enjoyed this. But ground us, to, help us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, just to come back to the practical, because I think part of the concern you're bringing up, Josh, is is on a practical level, right? And it's it's the idea that when you kind of have to massage people's expectations, right? Uh, in 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 ways when it comes to having conversations about God, because when most people here, I think who who you know, might not be familiar with these types of conversations or philosophy of religion in general, that you've got a demonstration or proof, I think they expect like you're going to give them a two plus two equals four. And like some, like, it's going to compel them to assent, right? Or something and like easily. that. And if it, if it doesn't, if right. you find one rational person who has a question, then it doesn't work. The argument is boring. Right. And, and I think we would all agree that if that's your expectation, we need to massage that. Right. And, um, yeah, and if I could just add, because I really do care, I think a lot about this, is, is I think sometimes people are resisting arguments being used as sort of vehicles for control. Mm. Like, you disagree with me? Well, I can prove to you with this demonstration um, that I'm right. Mm -hmm. And and I, and I really, I, I feel like I come on both sides of that, um, where I can see an argument being used for something I think is true. And it's easier for me to maybe think, oh, this is cool. This is a pathway of reason. But then when somebody uses an argument for, I, against something that I think is true and mm -hmm. they present it as a demonstration it is kind of what you said Pat about it's almost like okay massage my expectation here because um, I'm feeling like you're trying to like control my mind and you're, you're saying mm -hmm. if I don't agree with you if I just have a different view then you're going to just think that I'm irrational or ignorant uh, which is right. not what we're wanting to say here right and I think um and I find myself in, in agreement really with with uh, all of this in the sense that there is this massaging that expectation has to be done. And the real value in arguments, I know you said this before, Josh and, and Gavin, I think you would agree with this, is it's it's a tool. It is a tool, right, um, to, to try and get at the truth of the matter. So I definitely want to say that, yeah, I, I think we can have a demonstration in the way that we've been talking about. But with both of you guys, I wouldn't say that if somebody doesn't see it, they're irrational or to be excluded from the conversation right? because there was a time when I didn't see it, right? Like I, st I studied both of your guys' works and it, it took time for me to really grasp it. And the other thing I want to say is um, because, because I studied both kind of, I guess, a traditional Thomistic metaphysical approach and, and, and Josh, some of your con more contemporary stuff, I actually found a lot of value and um, mutual clarification between the projects and i'll just i'll kind of yeah. give one example so josh and maybe we could talk about this uh, i want to allow you guys to wrap up any of the threads previously if we want to circle back to that but josh you have this argument from limits right and the argument from limits is is really trying to um move past the gap problem in a sense right and then but then i study Thomistic metaphysics and i understand the argument of the real distinction i'm like these are actually very similar. Structurally the same, yeah. Very, very similar, but they're yeah. different enough that they actually, I would argue, they actually reinforce each other mm -hmm. in, in cool ways. And, that's, and, that, and that makes me feel um, even more confident about the conclusion in a sense, to say like, oh, look, we, can, we have these kind of two different tools. They are structurally similar, but they're also yeah. different enough, right? And they converge upon the same conclusions. Um, so I see value in that. I see a lot of value in that. So- I'm going to pause there. I'll let you guys go and close any threads that you want to do previously, but then I would want to actually maybe dive a little bit deeper mm. into, uh, into the real distinction and your um, mm. argument from limits and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. if, if I may just close one thread uh, quickly, it's that um, I just want to affirm that I think somebody can see even everything that I take myself to see and, and still not agree with me. And, and I kind of have to say this because there are certain people who've come very close to me and I'm convinced that they are swimming in my epistemic uh, structures. And they're seeing, of course, they don't see everything that I see, but, but I have to just say, I think it's possible to see all the things that I see and still have good reasons to be skeptical, even if in the end, um, I, I think that I'm, I'm seeing something that's true. So I, I, I hope I'm not being overly charitable, but I, I just have this, this I'm not being overly charitable. I, I just I just want to say this because I just know that these conversations get can get very complex and people can can come into a place and they can they can 
understand things very well. And I don't want to suggest that the disagreement is only because um, I know more than you do. And I just, I guess I just care enough. I just want to say that. So hmm. maybe I'm um, so one of the things, um, one of the reasons why I kind of was eager to take our conversation down that issue of propositional and non-propositional content is because I think it feeds into how we do metaphysics. Um, because if, if there is conceptual content, if, if you know, the, the realm of the conceptual is unbounded and we can still be realists in affirming that. So, you know, you're probably familiar with the whole McDowell and, you know, sort of account of that in the Pittsburgh school. Um, yeah. If the conceptual is unbounded and propositional content is a specification of the conceptual content, which um, we have from the ground level up, then I would want to say that clarity is a feature of that content as derived from the world as brought into view by means of our, you know, perceptual cognitional capacities. Um, so that whenever we have propositions which are clear, it's not in virtue of how we specify those propositions or of how we react to those propositions. In other words, it's not, it's not us being clear about the propositions. Mm -hmm. It's about the propositions being a clear manifestation of what the nature of reality is. If that can be the case. And I mean, I suppose maybe later that in the conversation, sense. I would like to get chatting to you about, you know, the, your work at the minute on minds and consciousness, you know, and how it ties in with us. Um, if that can be the case, then we can form clear propositions about reality and just not be clear on them at all. Just not be, you know, aware of what's going on here. And it would take some effort on our part to kind of, you know, conform our thinking to that. And I think maybe that's where that, um, you know, when we say that somebody has a bit further to go to sort of grasp the argument, it's because they need to become clear on, you know, the argumentation itself, rather than the argumentation having to, you know, so something happened, have, having to happen to the argumentation in order to convince someone. So I, I suppose that's why I sort of brought it down um, that alleyway, because I think there are moves in, you know, epistemology and philosophy of mind um, that are made here, which are, lie under the surface of these sorts of arguments and the yeah. kind of conclusions we want to, you know, develop, get out of these arguments. Um, do you it, have it, any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's beautiful. Actually, I was just thinking that what you're saying, it might be like the argument. It's like a mirror. And, and the mirror is sort of clear insofar as it's representing uh, reality. It's mirroring mm. reality. Yeah. And and that that's a clarity like in the mirror, which is representing the clarity of reality, even mm. if somebody doesn't see the mirror. Yes. Yeah. And so and I, I'm, I'm sort of translating what you're saying in a way that um, is congruent, I think, with, with what I'd want to say as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Look at that. Philosophical yeah. progress can be made. If this is possible. <laughs> it actually happened. About that. When we're in rapport and, and we have respect for each other and, and we're not trying to win, right? Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So can we talk about, because I definitely want to get to the mind stuff, Josh, because I know it's argument, fresh Let's mind. do argument from limits. That's mm. what you want to talk about a little bit so, and then so, the mind stuff. Yeah. So why don't you just sketch it out? Obviously, you don't have to do all, all the details, but just to get it on the table and then uh, I'd love... Um, just to yeah to explore how it connects with uh, some of what um, what Gavin has has written. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, so it's interesting, Gavin, when you were talking about this sort of argument for a first cause that's mm. purely actual, and you said if it's purely actual, it wouldn't be a natural object. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and I, and I was sort of thinking of um, my naturalist friends, and and I actually have a book uh, on is God the best explanation of things? It's a dialogue, and toward the end of the book, I offer a version of theism, a version of the existence of God, that I, I call it supreme naturalism, because it actually takes that initial object, says, oh, maybe it is a natural object. It's just, it's supreme in its nature. Now, now may, maybe that's just an abuse of the term natural, and, and, and I don't want to, you know, uh, fight over words. Um, but a question I think that I would have is, why think this initial object, even if it's purely actual, has a supreme nature? You know, like why, why would it be a being than which no greater could be thought or, or possible, right? Uh, why would it be a being that would be worth worshiping or honoring? Uh, why would it have all knowledge? Why would it have all power? And that's where this sort of argument from limits comes in. I was sort of extending 
a um, kind of familiar path of reasoning where we explain things out as far as we can. We look at objects in the world and we think, oh, what could explain those objects? And it seems to me that if we're going to arrive at some original entity that has no further explanation, then there's got to be some kind of like relevant difference between the explained and the unexplained. You know, like what, what would make this the kind of thing that couldn't be further explained? You might say, well, maybe it's a purely actual turtle. It's like, well, no, it couldn't be. So this is what you're thinking, Gavin. This is on your mind. It couldn't be a turtle if it's purely actual, mm, yeah. right? Yeah. But then, but why not? You say, well, because if it was a turtle, it'd have potentiality. Well, well, why would it have potentiality? Why, why couldn't it just be necessarily the case that has those turtle shapes with no potential for different shapes? I don't like and, the term necessarily there. Okay, well, you know, what, why? It, it's purely actually those shapes and it has no potential for different shapes, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, it, and, and I think an answer to that, at least to, to my mind, and, and you can illuminate this uh, in your system, mm. is that the difference between shape, triangle, circle, turtle shape, mm. it does, just doesn't seem like it's gonna, it's gonna be a relevant difference for, uh, with respect to having a, a further explanation or even the possibility of a further explanation. Mm -hmm. So it seems like you could always further explain turtles, uh, mm -hmm. which is why if there is an original unexplained thing, it wouldn't be a turtle. Mm -hmm. So this is yeah. kind of my argument from, from limits is the idea is that anything that's limited in some way is mm -hmm. going to differ from other limited things yep. in ways yep. that don't make the mm -hmm. difference between the explained and the unexplained. So therefore, mm -hmm. ultimate reality is going to have a supreme nature, which mm -hmm. is the kind of nature that doesn't entail arbitrary yeah. limits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's the idea. No, that's very good. That's that that reminds me of a principle in Thomas that unreceived act is unlimited. So any specification mm -hmm. of actuality is received actuality uh, or limited actuality. Yeah. Specification. So the, yeah, that's good. So the turtle is some sort of specification of actuality. And if the turtle as a specification of actuality were conceived of as pure actuality, then it would have to exclude all non-turtle forms of actuality. So any actual things after the turtle would just be specifications of turtle actuality. It would be species of turtle in yeah. a sense. Um, so as to allow for the multiplicity of things, to allow for non-turtle actualities, that which is pure actuality can't be identical to any of those specifications. Or from what I'm understanding on your account, um, anything which is in it to any degree limited um, can't be, you know, the extent of, of limitation or that which is unlimited from which all the limited derives would that be a good yeah. representation of your point yeah yeah so i mean definitely i, I see in you know the, the sort of thomas view unreceived act is unlimited you know i can't a convergence here with uh your own account yeah and, and pat or remind us that argument from father spencer yeah robert spencer yeah so yeah, he yeah yeah he's he's good because he kind of I see him as kind of a bridge between you two in, yeah. in a sense. And um, which I, which I appreciate uh, for, again, if, if nothing else for just pedagogical reasons, right. I think that, that, that seeing these different approaches can, can help uh, bring clarity to each approach. Right. Um, so like Josh, for your, um, for your argument from limits, there just seems something kind of intuitive about it. Like, yeah, things that are sort of bounded that some sense kind of like run up against the, um, a restriction on their intelligibility. That was that that was restricted. This right? that's Spitzer, right? Yeah. Is is yeah. restrictions, right, on being, um, actually, actually uh, block out other beings. So to go to your um square circle example, Spitzer, he he wants to say that the you know principle of non contradiction is it's it's an ontological principle, right? The boundaries on being of one thing necessarily block out yeah. boundaries of of being on something else. Mm -hmm. So in order to have, um, an explanation for any restricted finite uh qualitatively finite reality um you're going to need something that's going to be compatible with all of that right and mm. so he gets back to just an unrestricted act of understanding the classic idea of a thought thinking itself and if and if the fundamental reality were a turtle it were restricted yes. the boundaries of being would fundamentally be, it be exclusive and to, something would have to would, then restrict it something would have to be prior to it to restrict mm. it right so it and 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 it would block out. It couldn't ground anything. And that's kind of what Gavin's at. So you kind of see the uh, yeah. the, the, the harmony here of any other reality um, that, you know, anything that would be um, incompatible with a turtle is the fundamental reality, which would probably be a lot of things, right? Couldn't exist. 
right? Because yeah, it, could, yeah, it couldn't I, I, have its 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 conditions for um, existence fulfilled by a by a turtle. By a turtle. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because I, I heard Spencer's argument. He was on the radio. He came on the radio, mm-hmm. and and he was giving this argument for this unconditioned condition for everything else. And I was thinking, oh, this argument actually sounds very much like the argument that I give for a foundation of everything else. He wasn't giving an argument for a finite chain. Mm-hmm. It wasn't his argument. It was this argument that there's take the totality of reality. Mm-hmm. There's nothing outside of it. Mm-hmm. And so he was saying, he was using the same argument, take the totality of the conditions. Mm-hmm. That totality has no condition beyond it. And so he argues for an unconditioned condition of everything else on the basis of, of this. And I'm thinking, wow, that, that really sounds familiar. And I was actually thinking, did, did he read my book? Like this is, this is sounding like my argument. And then he goes on to that second stage that, that gap to fill the gap. And he makes this argument from restrictions and saying mm-hmm. all these restricted things need a restrictor. Mm-hmm. And because differences in restriction aren't going to be relevant to a difference with respect to having no need for an explanation or cause or condition. So therefore the unconditioned condition of everything else has to be an unrestricted reality. And I thought, well, this is structurally the same as my argument from uh, a, a, the first cause having no arbitrary limits mm-hmm. uh, because all limits would have further causes and conditions. Mm-hmm. And so I do think there's, there's different arguments in different traditions that if you, th- this is, this is my, my conviction on this and people can disagree with this, but it seems like if you follow the light of reason, if you really pay attention um, within these different frames, you'll end up with a kind of convergence uh, from those different frames. Right. And that at first you might not recognize the convergence because they're worded in different language. Like the Thomists use all their, their language. And, and so you don't recognize that there's a convergence, mm-hmm. but I have to believe that like reason leads to like truth. Mm-hmm. And so it's not going to contradict itself. Right. And the mm-hmm. one thing again, that I'll just, I'll just emphasize. And then Gavin, I want to get some more of your thoughts on this is, um, mm. is, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just cool to see that convergence, right? Like, it's, mm. it's, it's actually kind of striking, and it's, it's something that, that still strikes me. Even now, I'll, I'll discover, I think, a new frame every now and then. And then that will shine clarity on, on other things. Like, you know, there were times yeah. when I'm like, you know, I'm wrestling with the deeper, you know, metaphysics, and it was actually reading kind of people who stepped outside of the tradition a little bit, you know, like um, Father Spitzer, who – um, I don't, he's not, a, he's a Jesuit. So, you know, he's definitely like Thomistic friendly. I don't know if he considers himself a Thomist, but then, then you Josh too. And just like the way you guys come at it actually helped me to better understand what Thomas was saying. Like it brought clarity over there and things started to click. So again, I think there's value um, in seeing the convergence and whatever you want to draw from that. But there's also value as a, as just a pedagogical device too. I think it really, for me anyways, me, me I'm just, I'm just, kind of dumber so sometimes i need multiple approaches <laughs> to get something right but um yeah so yeah gavin any any further thoughts on any of this uh-huh. and the immediate thing there when you you guys were talking and uh we were just seeing this convergence that you know in, in thomas terms any specification of actuality um is dependent on that which is pure actuality or you know what is through another is reducible to what is per se or, you know, what is limited, you know, yeah. is kind of um, dependent on that, which is unlimited or unbounded. Um, I'm reminded of uh, Whitehead's, you know, History of Western Philosophy as footnotes to Plato. And the move that seems to be being made here is that which exists in a participated sort of way is reduced to that which um, participates in nothing. So, um, that, mm-hmm. you know, the, the overarching principle in which everything participates, the unbounded um, that's just pure act on move mover, all of that. It's a very platonic sort of move. The, the, the unlimited and the perfect in Platonism is the immaterial. Well, it's, it's the form um, and it's most perfect. Whereas in Aristotelianism, the unlimited is prime matter, which is most yeah. imperfect, which is pure potency. Yeah. Aristotelianism isn't friendly to this sort of move here. Um, where it's, whereas it's, you know, it's, it's this sort of Platonism, that platonic move from what's dependent and limited, um, depending on and participating in what's independent and what's unlimited. And that runs throughout Thomism, which unfortunately, given the Aristotelian terminology, people don't see, and Thomas mm. is explicit in a number of places, oh, I see. The Platonists I see. got it right. The Platonists mm. got it right when it comes to God. They didn't get it right when it comes to the forms, but they got it right when it comes to God. And he says that so many times. Um, and this sort of uh, platonic 
reasoning, if not explicitly platonic, you know, is being found in the sort of arguments that you guys are putting forth as well. So my initial thought is, you know, the convergence of these traditions sort of just shows the, I don't know, the forcefulness of the kind of platonic worldview. Hmm. Josh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, no, that's good. I was, I was going to just say, you know, the convergence would, I think, occur in the best versions of the views. Mm. And then the idea is that um, reason helps you to figure out which views are inferior. And so certain interpretations of the views will fall by the wayside. Mm. Uh, but that's an interesting point, Gavin, about the, the idea that you have a kind of platonic core that um, shows up in the sort of conclusion of the ultimate, having a sort of, in my terms, um, a nature uh, you know, you say pure, purely actual, it's not a pure nothingness or it, it's, mm. it's a pure something and it has all the resources for everything else. Mm. And you need to have something like that. I mean, and I was actually just thinking that maybe it's kind of helpful to have the language of like pure actuality or pure perfection rather even than being unbounded or unlimited. And the reason for that is because when you think of the unbounded, at least for me, it's almost like I'm starting with my concept of bounded things and then I'm adding them up to infinity. And so I actually have like an infinite number of bounded things or I have an infinite extended uh, space or something like that. And it's like, well, that, that's not really the concept of a perfect being. I mean, perfect being is not um, an infinite being in the sense that you Spatial take something finite and like you just that, pull yeah. it out to infinity. Uh -huh. um, mm. it's, it's more like you subtract and remove all the restrictions, all the boundaries, all the potential, you know, all of that. And then what's left is something pure, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even simple, you know, it's yeah. just this pure perfection. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then that provides the, the anchor for everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that's important because it designates a way, a kind of theism or a way of thinking about theism, which is um, being attacked quite a bit. Um, today in philosophical circles, you, you know, I mean, people refer to it as classical theism. I mean, I don't like that term because there do is you feel no under classical... attack, Gavin. Do, do you, are you taking this attack personally? No, just, no. <laughs> just, just tease and just just poking you a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, that I mean, no, okay. I, I was joking with Pat earlier that um, there is no such thing as the classical theist, um, huh. so that there isn't you know classical theism, but because we see these platonic tendencies running throughout a lot of what people would call classical theism. The idea that, you know, all that is dependent, you know, depends on what is independent in itself. That stands in significant contrast to non-classical accounts of theism where, mm -hmm. um, you know, the God on that account isn't quite independent in himself. He depends on creation in some way because he has some sort of real relation. He's co-variable with creation. Uh, his knowledge changes and mutates with creation. Um, he's one way before he creates and a different way after he creates all those things, which I, I like some of those things. There, there, there might be some, maybe another time we can have a, a little bit of a tension conversation about that. I actually kind of like, like yeah. some of those real changes. Um, oh, well, maybe we could have it now if you want. Hey, it's, 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 it's hot off in the presses right now. If you guys have the, have the time to engage it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I sort of like to, uh, have a wide range of options to mm -hmm. a conclusion that mm -hmm. I think would be significant. So, you know, I, I hate mm -hmm. to push off options, but I mean, my, my view would be that um, I have a kind of dynamic view of time uh, where things that exist, uh, exist now, if there is a now. Mm -hmm. And on my view, time proceeds from change. So as long as there's changing things and there's, there's a now. Mm -hmm. um, since I think God exists, I think God exists now. Mm -hmm. And this does, I think, imply some kind of real relations. Now, maybe, maybe there's a friendly trans translation where God is intrinsically timeless, but extrinsically temporally related. But, um, but I, on this account, God would change in his awareness of what is presently the case. Wonderful. So if I raise my hand, yeah. God's knowledge mm -hmm. of the hand yeah. being raised is different than in the past. Wonderful. Great. Lovely stuff. Right. Um, so... What I want to agree with there, um, I think the account of time, I mean, we could, we could get into that, but I, I want to say, you know, the now exists and time is measured by succession or the time piggybacks on succession and change. So if you don't have succession and change, you don't have time. I'm with um, you on that, yeah. 
So I, I want to agree with that. And I want to agree that creatures um, can change and there's yeah. all different ways in which creatures could be. But I don't want to agree that um, God's knowledge of creatures changes with the change of creatures. And here's why. Yeah. Um, if God's knowledge would change with creatures if God's knowledge of creatures were dependent on some sort of conceptual content, which is a direct manifestation of those creatures. So when I, let's say when I know a tree, I have the concept of a tree and that's how I pick out that tree. That's how I come to terms with it. When God knows that tree, he doesn't have the concept of a tree. The, the, the conceptual content that by which he knows the tree is the divine essence itself. Oh, hold on. So are you saying God's knowledge of the tree is non-conceptual? No, no, it's conceptual. Okay, the, so he, he does have a conceptual contact with the tree. The, but the conceptual content isn't the concept of a tree. The conceptual content is the divine essence itself. It's, it's the divine essence by which he knows the tree. It's not a concept of a tree by which he knows it. So is this, so just, just to clarify, so... So I, okay, I have a, a metaphysical demonstration that you're wrong. Okay, okay. I'm just playing with you here. Okay. Um, I, I don't know. I, I actually probably don't. Um, <laughs> but just so so just to clarify, are, are, is the is the idea that God's knowledge of the tree is the same knowledge as his knowledge of a rock, or are those different knowledges? Um, God's knowledge is of the divine essence, and in knowing the divine essence, he knows the rock and the tree and anything else. Okay. And then his divine e essence, you'd say, I think is, is simple, doesn't have distinction. Mm. I guess may maybe where I get lost is like, well, how does he distinguish the rock, the knowledge of the rock from the knowledge of the tree? If both knowledges are mediated through the knowledge of one undifferentiated essence with no mm. distinctions within it. it it's a, maybe there's a translation here, but it's almost like going back to the mirror. It's almost like, well, God's knowledge is like a, a mirror of reality. Mm-hmm. And so that if there's distinctions in reality, there's going to be distinctions in the mirror. Mm -hmm. So several things you can say here. Um, uh, you talked earlier about just seeing, you know, kind of a demonstration on its component yeah. parts. Yeah. So you, you just grasp in a single insight all the mm -hmm. different component parts of a demonstration. Now that insight um, isn't the several insights by which the demonstration is grasped. It's just a single insight where you see it. And, you know, we do this all the time when we That's do, good. you know, when we do logic, you know, propositional calculus, you know, you see a sequent and you just see how the sequent is resolved. And then you do the whole, you know, premise, premise, modus ponens, tollens, all of that. Um, but, you know, you can just see the sequent and see the solution to it. Or, you know, you can just see the truth table if you're good at logic or whatever. Um, so I would say God's knowledge um, of the divine essence is like that. He can just see the truths about other things just in seeing uh, the divine essence. Now, technically speaking, what, what we mean here is that in knowing the divine essence, he knows his power perfectly. And so he knows anything which could be a result of that power. Um, so he knows anything which could come to be. But intelligibly speaking, his, his seeing everything in the divine essence is like being able just to see, you know, a demonstration the way you described earlier, just in a single insight. Mm -hmm. Let yeah, me, so um, if, if, if I, I know, yeah, sorry, if, if I may, um, I just have like one follow up, but go, go ahead, Pat. I think you wanted to. No, no, um, because I, it's, it's just very fascinating hearing this exchange because I often, I often want to say, well, maybe there's a bridge here. And, and don't get me wrong, like sometimes I think it's good just to have like disagreement, it's one side or the other. But I was just curious because Gavin and I have been talking about this, and, and, and Josh, I know that you're, you're friends, and, um, I don't know how regularly you talk with, with Alex Proust, but I like, um, uh, uh, something like Matthews Grant's extrinsic model of divine simplicity. And I wonder if that might serve a bridge here, because I think that might allow us to say that, you know, in God's understanding of himself, he, he understands in, in one perfect act, all the ways that thing could participate in being. But then if God knows a tree, um, his, his knowledge is, is, um, is in a sense, at least in, in I think, I don't know if you would agree with this, Josh, uh, it, is the cause of the tree. Right. So he really does know the tree and that's a change on the side of the creature. But that's that's an extrinsic predication. Mm -hmm. And uh, at least the way I think about it, th that type of predication, that type of change is compatible with uh, divine simplicity and, and this or that. So I think that gives us a lot of what we might call contingent latitude or stuff like that. And it seems like, 
that might be compatible both with what you're saying and with what Gavin's saying. Yeah, um, no, th this is or actually it's a what... model we could put out there that that I think might serve as a bridge, not in an ad hoc way, but the way I'm hearing both of you talk about this, I'm like, seems like this might be, um, because I'm not sure I disagree with anything either of you two are saying. I just kind of see the different perspectives. Well, you're I, this at is it, interesting right? because Pat, this is exactly what I was. This is going to be my next uh, thought or question was, could we sort of bring the views together where sort of intrinsically God has one single act of awareness by which he can see many things mm -hmm. and the many is external to God. It's out there in the world. And as the many changes, that doesn't mean that God changes intrinsically. Mm -hmm. I think there, a, a question that would remain for me is how do you characterize the relationship between God and those things? Mm, right. So one, you know, one thing that I would hear sometimes people say is like, well, God doesn't have any real mm -hmm. relations that change. And there it might just be a matter of translation, but I, I'm not really sure how to even understand that. I mean, let's say you just take the relation of a coexistence. So God coexists with me mm -hmm. and I'm annihilated. Um, and then God doesn't coexist with me. It's not intrinsic change. It's purely in a change mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think John, if I could just one more thing about that and then I'll let Gavin get in this is the way, um, I think, well, I, I have Grant's book fresh in my mind. So, and then I'll let Gavin chime in, but he would say when we're talking about real relations there, it's just that there's no real foundation in God in God for that. Um, that the relationship is just the effect call it E um, existing and it's causal dependence on God yeah. and the effects can differ right across all possible worlds. We want to do it, but God would remain essentially the same. And Grant's cool on this. The reason I like Grant is he shows that this actually supports libertarian freedom, right? Because mm -hmm. there's no factor both logically prior to and sufficient for the effect. So, um, there's a sort of counterfactual power, uh, there that if you're, if you're a libertarian, you're, you're probably going to like that. If you're not a libertarian, then, then maybe not. But a lot of what Grant's project is doing with the extrinsic model is to show that if you, if you have this mixed relations, right, where you, uh, the creature is really related to God, but God is just rationally related to the creature. Uh -huh, uh -huh. We can push to contingency extrinsic. We can preserve divine simplicity in the way that most of us, uh, are thinking about it here. And we can have our libertarian cake and eat it too, which is- no, I love you know. that. That's a beautiful translation. I mean, that, that would be something that I would resonate with. Yeah. Now, Gavin, right, I'm not sure if there's anything you would disagree with any of that or anything you'd want to add. I am uh, trying to be a bridge builder here. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Well, the first thing I would maybe want to say is um, Grant's book arrived at my desk two days ago. So um, I've yet to read it. So I do I have to sit down it. and read it. Um, you uh, said you have read it, Josh? No, I have, I have not. So I appreciate okay. your, your little synopsis there. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, um, it's, it's this one, by the way. If I, you know, oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Uh, it's called Free Will and God's uh, Universal Causality Dual Sources mm. for the interested uh, listener. So I think a lot of this turns on the doctrine of mixed relations, you know, that God has a logical relation to creatures and creatures have a real relation to God. Yeah. The reason why creatures have a real relation to God is because there's a foundation in the creature by which they are related to God, such that you remove that foundation, you remove the creature. And that's, on the Thomist account, that's the act of existence, which uh, creatures enjoy. Um, and without that, the creature ceases to be. But there's no foundation in God which relates gods to creatures, such that um, if that foundation were to disappear, God would be in some way different. Um what I, what I would want to argue is that um, God is just being, well, pure actuality, pure existence itself. When he brings about creatures, um, he not only makes use of his knowledge, but um, he makes use of his will and his power so that uh, any creature which is brought about is brought about not only because God, you know, sort of sees a possible manifestation of, you know, being or actuality, but he wills it to be so and I'm willing it to be so he brings it about. Now, God's power is not a principle of his acting in the way that, you know, let's say, you know, well, I mean, uh, Pat and I are gym goers. We like to go to the gym. You know, we have power to lift a certain amount of weight, and then that'll be a principle for our actually lifting that weight. It's not like mm -hmm. that in God. God's power isn't a principle of his acting. It's a power of the thing. It's, it's a principle of the thing produced. Uh, in other words, a principle of, you know, the, the creature by which the creature exists. So it's not the case that prior to the creature existing, God's power isn't doing anything. And then after the creature's existing, God's power is doing something. Mm. Rather, um, God's power simply has an extrinsic effect 
Um, when creatures are brought about, they're by say, signifying no change in God before and after creation. So all in all, what I would want to say here is that um, God, God is always alone. There is, you know, the, the, the kind of, you know, uh, relate to a recent article, there is no alone world um, contrasted with, you know, the non-alone world. God just is alone, which is God's transcendent. Creatures are not alone. Creatures exist with God, but God doesn't exist with creatures. So regardless of whether or not creatures exist, um, God always remains just as he is, as uh, pure existence itself. And so when it comes to God's knowledge, then because God has knowledge by the divine essence and not some conceptual content drawn from creatures, um, God knows then which creatures are related to his power and which creatures aren't related to his power because he has perfect knowledge of his power. Um, and that doesn't change with the uh, variability of creatures. How does that sit? I think that, yeah, so I, 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 sorry, just, yeah, go ahead and, and follow up. I was going to say that could be a, a wonderful thing to explore in 10 different conversations, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I was just going to say something simple, which is, mm -hmm. um, I, I appreciate that. I was just thinking that, I think there are different ways of interpreting that. Mm -hmm. And I was finding myself thinking sort of in Pat's way of like, okay, is there a interpretation, a kind of bridge building interpretation that is congruent with uh, things that I think are true. And, mm. and, it, it, and it seems like, I think there probably is, you know? And so mm -hmm. there are ways of interpreting that where it's like, Oh, I don't know if that that's true or not, but this is, I think one of the, maybe even more important in sort of figuring out those particular details to me mm. is kind of how you approach these big questions in yeah. a way that you personally can have um, a kind of productive journey to see more and more. And then if you're in a position of influence, you can help others have a productive journey where they're seeing more. It's not necessarily mm. even the case that they're seeing more of what you personally see, but they're getting more powers to see things mm. for them for themselves. And and it seems like one of the principles is to look for the most charitable interpretation you can find. And it might even be that it wasn't even an interpretation that was intended, but it actually extends the view in a positive direction. Um, it might yeah. be that it was the interpretation that was intended and, and you're more likely to find that interpretation if you're, if you're charitable. And I, and I find that that's very helpful. It's really helped me to see, you know, we talked about convergence, mm -hmm. how very different views can then work as kind of like tension devices. Wisdom flows through tension, I think. Mm -hmm. And so they work as kind of tension devices. And then as you're looking for the most charitable version of the one view and the most charitable version of the other, you do sort of find your way towards a kind of interesting convergence mm -hmm. um, in my experience. Yeah. yeah the, the other thing, Josh, and this is something I, I think I first got from you. If not, I'm just going to give you credit for it anyways. But I know, uh, I'm know i pretty sure it was you. And it's such a good principle is that Look, a lot of this stuff is really hard, right? <laughs> it's really, really hard. Um, but we should we should use what is clear as much as possible to shine light on what is unclear. Yeah. And um, what a yeah, I think right, that was from you, Josh. I think right? it was. Yeah, no, I've, I've been yeah. calling this the flashlight principle. Yeah, you and know, you you look for what's the clearest, and then you let that extend your light. Right, into other and, and and we shouldn't let what is unclear. Um, just allow us to arbitrarily reject the things that were clear before because there is unclarity, right? And yes. I think that's some, something that people do is like you get to this point of unclarity, you're not sure, there's challenges, there's tensions, and then like they throw their hands up and they get rid of everything. Well, well no, that stuff was clear. Don't get rid Absolutely. of that. Absolutely, yes. Well, especially like if, if you're in this dark cave and all your friends are in this dark cave and, and mm -hmm. somebody says, no, actually, here's a flashlight. And you're like, wait a minute, if that flashlight works, then this cave isn't dark. Therefore, yeah. that flashlight can't work. Because what are you saying? That we actually could see things in here? No, there's, there's controversy. The reason there's controversy is that we can't see. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I appreciate that. I mean, but if you personally are taking a light and you see that it would actually does shine that cave, maybe the right thing to do is just to go take that light further into the cave mm -hmm. rather than run out of the cave and say, well, you know, this light can't work in there because it's dark in there. Right. It's like, no, you have a light. So it maybe you can see things in there that you couldn't see before. Maybe that's a possibility. Right. And the cool thing about a number of these, you know, um, difficulties and challenges with the unclear area. And let's, let's, let's just like label, like when we get to God, right. Cause I think with a number of these arguments, like we kind of want to say like, yeah, we really feel like we have got to God, but it's just like 
barely a fingertips grasp, right? It's, it's very unclear. Uh, the challenges and the criticism, I think, can be helpful because it can, it can, I think, help us to want to shine the flashlight or try to shine the flashlight in certain areas to see, can we, can we investigate this more? Can we learn more? And, and maybe at some point, uh, we, we can't, right? At some point, there really is just a mystery that we just, we just can't pass it. Uh, um, but why not try, right? Why, why, why not, not try? Why, why yeah, not try? Why, why not keep trying? Um, I, I don't know how that connects to everything that you guys have been talking about, but it just popped in my head. It's, it's sort of useful for making progress. I mean, I was even thinking, Gavin, when you were talking, I appreciated something mm -hmm. you did was you took something that I had early, earlier said in the conversation about knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and then you used that later and said, you know, take that concept that you, you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. apply that to God's knowledge, and you can see how God could have this kind of intuition. And it was like, well, that was very helpful because you took something that was already clear to me. And then, and then you use that to make clear, you know, a view that you were expressing. And, and I think that is a way to make progress. You look for the clear and then you extend from there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Very good. So um, this has been awesome. I know we want to talk about persons. Josh, how are you on time? Is that your beautiful family I hear in the background? By the way? I've got my kids coming in here. Uh, I'm good. I mean, are you, is you guys good to keep going for a little bit? Um, yeah. I'm okay. good. It's only it's only getting close to midnight here, so yeah. you know. Yeah, well, I know you've got the stamina all night. I, I'm like a nine o'clock bedtime kind of guy. I don't know how you do it. <laughs> okay, so um, and we could circle back to any of this more later if we want, but I think that's actually really helpful because I think again, genuine progress was was made there, and and clarity was kind of um, um, put on on the 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 perspectives, and and I think what you find is that sometimes you you might start at a position where you think that there's. Uh, substantial disagreement and you realize actually actually no there's there's more harmony here mm. than you initially thought um and mm. um, maybe just to point out the cool thing you know that happens there is you know whenever you, josh you were saying you know oh well, we might have a few things to say there but maybe we could get into it later and it was like well let's do it now you know let's, let's now, yeah. uh, you know get into it i mean i think that's how these sorts of discussions have to move forward by yeah. Instead of people saying, oh, well, we'll just agree to disagree. It's well, no, we'll not. Let's let's talk through the disagreement. And oh, see yeah. where... I love the tension, you know, and I think it's helpful to think about wisdom as flowing from the tension. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that helps to motivate people. And, and I think it also helps when you understand uh, how to have a productive conversation with attention. I think if, if it's mm -hmm. always polarizing, then you never want to do it unless you just love, you know, feeling outraged right. or whatever, you know, but. Well, well, that's what I appreciate about both of you guys. And that's what I, I knew, like, I, I got to I got to have this conversation because I don't know if these, if Josh and Gavin agree on everything, I would, I would imagine there's things they don't disagree on, but well, I know, I when, we don't. <laughs> but when I know they do disagree, I know they'll be able to have a great exchange. And <laughs> you guys have definitely proven that uh, so far. And I, I, I put that out there because I think it is a, a, an amazing model and you're right because the tension can, there can be tension and it can be fun. Right. It doesn't have to be That's right. like sometimes people hear the word tension, they or, or they hear the word argument outside of. But like philosophers, Josh, you say this a lot like we, it's a love language. It's our love language. Yeah. <laughs> right? it's, yeah. that's, that's what philosophers are. arguments are a good thing for philosophers. Tensions, yeah. tension is a good thing. So very cool. All right. So let's now, Josh, let's go back to the to the gap thing again. And, and Gavin, I know you've been thinking a lot about uh, persons and mind and world as well. So this will be interesting. One way that you've um, attempted to kind of bridge the gap, so to speak, Josh, is start is is just thinking about consciousness yeah. and some of the implications thereof. So you've been thinking about this uh, a lot more recently because i know you're working on a new book so yeah what do you have for us put, put let's put something out there and let's have some fun with it yeah mm -hmm. well you know we we had a whole episode on consciousness before and mm -hmm. i talked about tools that you have to investigate your consciousness you have this kind of introspection by which you can sort of pay attention to your inner world and it's so fascinating as i'm writing the book it's it's like i'm seeing all the more the treasures within and the power that you have to explore that it's like you take for granted the things that are familiar, like your thoughts and your feelings, they're so familiar. You sort of wake up having thoughts and feelings, but like, don't mistake the familiar for the insignificant. You can hardly overemphasize the significance of consciousness. Like without consciousness, you have no hopes, no desires, no, uh, it, you have no thought about significance. It's like, there's just nothing. Like everything comes through your consciousness. Like all your knowledge comes through consciousness experience. And then, and then, when you investigate consciousness, it's like, well, there's a sense in which it's a mystery. You know, it's sort of great to say, you know, the mystery of consciousness, it's one of those dark caves, but then there's this cool flashlight you have that you can take with you into that cave. And there's multiple tools, multiple flashlights, but one of them right here that I'm thinking about is this power to pay, ten to pay attention 
uh, through introspection. Uh, you know, sometimes people say, oh, what's introspection? Introspection is, is something that you can't really trust or whatever. But the thing is, is that if you actually start using introspection to focus on your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, you can make distinctions. You can see that, oh, feeling happy is not the same as feeling sad. And without introspection, you couldn't make any distinctions like that. You couldn't even distinguish that this dream is different from another dream. I use the example of dreams because people say, well, dreams aren't based in reality. They're illusions or hallucinations. Like, okay, but you can still know things about experiences that don't match an outer world. Like you can know that one experience is different from another experience. And once you, and that might sound like basic and trivial and obvious, but it's really not because once you realize, oh, you can actually know some things with this power of introspection, then you're taking that flashlight in and you're thinking, okay, what else can I know? And so you can, you can begin to pay attention to um, not just that you have consciousness and that consciousness is sort of different from time and place, but you can start thinking about, okay, what unifies my consciousness? I mean, you, you, you could imagine like a pile of leaves with each leaf having a different feeling. That's different than there being a person or a, a self or a conscious center that has all those feelings, right? So it's not just like my brain has all these different feelings. It's like, there's also me, the one who has them. And so they're bound together. And, and one of the things that I'm doing in the book is I'm, I'm just starting by making observations. I'm collecting data. And so I say, I tell the readers, I'm going to take a broadly scientific approach where we're going to just make observations with our tools. And then we're going to come up with hypotheses to start to see if we can account for those observations. And we're going to test those hypotheses by making more observations. So that's, that's kind of the approach. And then the discovery, I mean, there's so many things to discover, but the discovery for me is that the first whole part of the book, part one, is showing that there are many parts of you that aren't reducible to material forms. Um, so you've got thoughts, you've got feelings, you have value, um, you have choice capacity. And I have a chapter for each one of those making the case that those aren't reducible to material forms. Um, and then from there, I ask the question, well, then how did these things all come to exist if they're not reducible to material forms? And so then I look at um, how to account for consciousness. And it's not as simple as emergence. People say, oh, well, consciousness emerges. But when you focus in on consciousness, you, you try to figure, okay, well, what is this and how, how could it emerge? Then you find that there's constraints. Like you can't just get uh, you know, the, the number five emerging from a water bottle or something, or like the thought that two plus two equals four are emerging from a bunch of sand thrown into the wind. So some emergence just isn't possible. And my argument is not against emergence. My argument is about how do we best explain the emergence of consciousness? Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you would, maybe we could we jump uh, and uh, Gavin chime in and push me aside at any minute here you want. Um, so Josh, actually on a recent podcast, I was jamming around with another friend uh, of, of ours, Jim Madden. I'm not sure if you've interacted with any of his stuff. And, and we actually were going back and forth on, on the identity argument. Um, and he, he, he disagreed with it, right? So we had, we had a good uh, moment of tension. This was on a, a, somebody else's podcast. Which, which, uh, which one? Which, which right. So it's, it's one that, uh, that a number of people make, but you're one of them, right? And okay. so this might be a good jumping off point, right? I can be directly aware of my thoughts without being directly aware of my brain states. So it seems like we have something true of A that is not true of B. So for anybody who wants to say that A equals B, we've got a problem here, right? Yeah. And uh, there's a number of, of uh, typical objections, uh, the Clark Kent or water objection or the two yeah. ones. And this is the one we were kind of jamming around. So maybe I will even put that one out there because the water one kind of ties into the, the emergence idea. And the idea is there, okay, there, there's got to be something wrong with this argument in general because I can be aware of water without being aware of H2O, right? Or once we have H2O, water emerges. So why couldn't this be the same case with consciousness and brain state? So since that was just a recent dialogue I had, I won't, I won't say go say what my response is. Where I don't want to, don't want to give you all the secrets. Not that I wasn't borrowing from you, Josh. Anyways, um, <laughs> yeah. What would be? I don't know if that'd be a good jumping off point. And then, uh, if that's even the first argument you would want to use, and then I want to move like, okay, what? How does that connect to the foundation of reality? And then, what what would Gavin think of, of all this? So yeah, a lot of stuff there. <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, in, in my book, I'm, I'm slowing everything down. And I think what I'm realizing is that just taking time to make distinctions 
make observations really helps to lay the groundwork so that before I get to any arguments, you sort of preempt a lot of objections because I really think a lot of these objections come from the fact that they're just different ways of interpreting the argument and certain interpretations just aren't gonna be good arguments. And so we gotta get clear. Um, I think it's, it is helpful to start, you know, what, with the clearest, like what's the clearest, right? And an example that I've given in previous writings is if you take a coin and you look at the front side of the coin and you notice that it's um, heads, okay? And then you turn it around, you see the backside, you see that it's, it's tails. And somebody says, well, you know, how do you know that the heads is not the same as the tails? Like, how do you know that? What's your argument for that? And you say, well, you know, it's a different shape. You could just look at it. Don't you see it's a different shape? And they come back and say, well, I mean, it seems to be a different shape, but how do you know you're not looking at the same shape from two different perspectives? You know, how, how do you know that, right? And at, there's some, at some point, I think you do have a power to just see distinction in a basic way. Like you could just see that true and false aren't the same or that square and circle aren't the same. Okay, I, I think ultimately that's the power you're gonna have to rely on. But then you can build an argument using that power. So here's an argument. Um, this, this is, a, I call it the awareness argument. I can be aware of the heads of the, of the coin without being aware of the tails of the coin. Okay, but if the heads is the tails, then by the law of identity, whatever's true of the heads is true of the tails. So if it's true that I'm aware of the heads, then if they're the same thing, then, I'm tr then it's true that I'm aware of the tails. So therefore, if I can be aware of the heads without being aware of the tails, then it does follow that they, the heads and tails cannot be the same thing. Okay, I think that's a sound argument. Now, what about these parodies where they say, well, look, you can be aware of H2O without being aware of water, or you can be aware of water that you're drinking water, but you don't know the molecular structure, you know, what's going on there. I think in every one of those cases, you're not actually directly aware of the thing in question. So take the, take the water example. Um, when I'm aware of drinking water, there's kind of an ambiguity in what I mean by drinking water. Do I mean my experience? Okay, I'm directly aware of my experience of drinking water, but that's not the H2O molecule, right? So um, the, ar the argument does work. It shows that my experience of drinking water isn't the same as the H2O molecule. But if you say, no, what you mean by water is whatever it is that's causing the watery experience. The watery experience isn't the water. The water is whatever's causing it. Well, then I'm not tempted to say that I'm aware of what's causing me to have that experience, uh, not in any kind of direct way you know, without being aware of H2O. There's no temptation to even believe that premise. And so I think that's where it's, it's, it's just a different argument. Um, and, and so it doesn't really work, doesn't translate over. Mm -hmm. What you wanna do is you wanna look at cases where you're directly aware, like take, for example, I'm directly aware of my happiness. I'm feeling a state of happiness right now being with you guys. I'm aware of that, I'm not lying to you. This is, this is just fun. Um, I'm not aware of any kind of anger right now towards you guys. And so therefore, Happiness and anger just can't be the same thing, mm -hmm. you know. And if you say that's not a good argument because of the the water objection, I say that's just that's just a different argument. Um, right. Well, real quick, and I want Gavin's thoughts on that. Is the the morning and evening star got brought up too, right? Yeah. And this is, you know, that's the other one. Yeah. They're the same thing, right? But it just but there are really distinct properties there. There's a property yeah. of being appeared to in the morning versus being that's appeared it. to in the evening. Yeah. Right. So once we take that into account, there is something that really isn't the same. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's uh, the other thing that I like to say as well, is that the reason that, that th thank you for bringing that one too, because mm -hmm. it's like the reason that you're even tempted to say that they're different is because there are differences that you're aware of. Right. Differences yeah. in the features that you're aware uh -huh. of the rising, the evening, rising yeah. in the morning. And, and yeah. I guess the Aristotelian could come in and give an account of new forms with water and HGO and stuff like that too. But I, but Gavin, what do you think of all this so far before we start trying mm. to bridge the gap? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a few things. I mean, the, the two, first of all, I mean, <laughs> the first thing I, I thought I was going to ask Josh about, but, but I'll not is, you know, can we know what it's like to be a bat? Um, that's one thing. Um, so Josh exactly knows exactly what I'm referring to there. Um, the other one is, you know, you're talking about water. Nobody's mentioned Putnam and Twin Earth. Um, you have the mental content externalism. Um, yeah. But I, I think maybe where I kind of want to go with this is, and I, I've always been sympathetic to the, the identity argument, and I've never really much been moved. You know, it, it was the Clark Kent, Kent, for example, was the one that, you know, 
um, we, we were always brought up on when looking at this. Um, but maybe where I want to go with this is I kind of just want to, you know, draw Josh. I want to draw you out, Josh, on, on the issue of consciousness. And I want to ask, is consciousness always of an object or can you have an empty consciousness? I don't. I don't really, I haven't fully made up my, my mind on that. I mean, so on, mm. on some days I sort of have toyed with the idea that I understand what you're asking, you know, that, that the mm. conscious experience is always of something, mm. um, some quality or something like this. Mm. Um, but I can also sort of have that gestalt shift where I, I see it, yeah. you know, it's the old woman, young woman sort of, it's just like, oh, it's just yeah. this raw conscious experience, not really of anything. Mm. Yeah. Um, but I think you, Maybe you're going to want to say, Gavin, that it is of because of the conceptual thing that you want to yeah. bring into that. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of Kantian when it comes to consciousness. And and I think Kant is quite Aristotelian when it comes to consciousness. There's a there's a kind of a thread in the history of philosophy, uh, which is contrary to Descartes um, and uh, you know, contrary to Hume in a certain, to a certain extent uh, that doesn't want to hold the, the consciousness is something occur that occurs within a privatized sort of space that rather consciousness is always consciousness of something and so has an intentionality to it and yeah. so what consciousness is is it's this ability that we have to uh, unify a set of experiences so that um we can be in a kind of special relation to the things of which yeah. we have an experience which is called you know an intentional relation so that we become conscious of ourselves as consciousness only through differentiating ourselves from those things which are not conscious. And I think in that, you get a good argument for the immateriality of conscious life, uh, precisely because um, if consciousness were any material thing, it wouldn't be able to stand in that relationship of always having an object because material things kind of you know uh -huh. have substantial being just in themselves like my brain yeah. can just have a substantial being in itself whereas consciousness never has that sort of substantial being to it um i'm wondering does that is, is that something you're sympathetic to oh i'm wondering kevin if, if you can give a modest a more modest version of that same argument where okay. Uh, you don't need to say that all consciousness is intentional. I mean, you can, right? But just for this argument for immaterial um, consciousness, you could say some consciousness is intentional, but then you could say that um, material objects are not intrinsically intentional. Mm -hmm. Would that yeah, kind of be your yeah. thought? I mean, and then that would be the premise that mm -hmm. we, we could look at that people might debate. They might say, well, maybe you could have a material object that's intrinsically intentional. But if you couldn't, then you've got your argument. And that argument, I think, would go through after that, mm. even if not all consciousness is intentional. Does that seem mm. right to you? Yeah, yeah. And the reason why I would maybe want to go that direction is because I want to avoid completely a Cartesian view of mentality. Um, that, that's something very much that I want to avoid. Um, and I get a sense on the account that you're giving that... Um, you're you're not entirely Cartesian. You don't you don't entirely seem to be convinced uh, by Cartesianism. But then you say it's just sometimes you have a good stalt shift where you can just have, you know, consciousness even without an object. Well, it's funny, you know, the, the Cartesian. It, I sort of have this kind of joke that like if you beat up on Descartes' view, you get points in the academy, you know, because like that's that's supposed to be like the very bad view, mm -hmm. uh, at least in certain circles. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. I think for me, I mean, one of the, one of the things that is kind of characteristic of my style is mm. I try to have a fresh approach where I come back to definitions later. So this mm. is what I'm doing in my book as well is mm. um, I'm starting with observations and then later, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. towards the end of the book, I begin mm -hmm. to give labels. Like, so now mm -hmm. you could call this a Cartesian view, but now mm -hmm. you know what I mean by this, right? Because yeah that Cartesian view can be interpreted in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, go ahead, please. No, I was just gonna say, cause in my conversation I had with, with Jim, um, we spent a lot of time talking about what we think mind specifically isn't. And we spent very little time to talk about what we think it is, Yeah. <laughs> right? Because it, for, for both of us that, you know, I just like peek into philosophy of mind. It's by no means a, a specialty for me. I'm just like, just very curious in it every now and then. Um, 
that seems easier to me <laughs> like to do mm -hmm. right like it seems like take like james, james i would be curious what you guys think of like ross's argument james ross's argument right he focused on rationality that the thoughts yeah yeah that you know thoughts you know formal thought content is is it's it's not ambiguous it's determinate but any physical event or process can always be represented in other ways it is ambiguous and so he, he would argue that no form at least formal thinking processes right um cannot be material or physical of course given a certain conception of material or physical but it's a very common one and he argues for the immateriality that way so that helps figure out what it's not it doesn't but it doesn't give you a complete account of human anthropology does it right well you know it's interesting because i would even take a step further that the very uh functions machine functions themselves aren't mm -hmm. even shapes or i mean See, I start to lose my grip. Like, what do you mean by material? Uh, I mean, I would argue that functions aren't themselves material features. Mm -hmm. So this is independent of Ross's argument. I mean, he would take a step further and say, there's no sort of machine function. There's always a kind of indeterminacy about like, you know, which, uh, you know, two plus two equals four, you know, that thought, like you can represent that using different functions. It's always indeterminate whether you've represented two plus two equals four or some uh, functional equivalent. But I would say, put even that argument aside, the very functions themselves, I wouldn't analyze in terms of mm -hmm. material features. But then this goes to, you know, what do you even mean by materiality? Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, is that, I mean, I think it is a good approach to, to say, okay, what's clear that, you know, my thought of cheese is not the same thing as cheese. Okay, so that's clear. My experience of love is not the same thing as a pineapple. Okay, that's clear. What can I say positively about these things? And this is where I think using that tool of introspection that I talked about, where you pay attention to the reality within your own consciousness is actually your, one of your most powerful tools to see what consciousness is. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I, I sort of have a way of characterizing dualism uh, or at least a certain form of it where like dualism is the view that consciousness just is what it seems to be from the first person perspective and not something else. Uh, this kind of flips things on, uh, on its head because a lot of times people will object to dualism saying, you know, why are you positing beyond all the material stuff that we know about this spooky extra stuff that we don't know about that we can't say anything about. And I guess, I mean, I just think it's exactly the opposite that what you know from your first person experience is the clearest thing that you know. Mm -hmm. And yeah, maybe there's some reason to deny that exists or to say that it's actually something different than it seems to be. But it seems like the burden then should be on the person claiming that consciousness is not what it seems to be, uh, not the person who says it is what it seems to be, and I'm not going to reduce it to something else. Mm. Yeah, I think I agree with that. Um, something that always struck me, you know, when we're thinking about bat-like experience is that there's something like, that it's like to be in a subjective state, which if we try to give it an objective account, we've lost the subjectivity of the state, um, right? That, I mean, that's Nagel's argument. Um, so, you know, if I say that I'm in pain and you say, well, you can't be in pain, your C fibers aren't firing, or, you know, you don't have C fibers or whatever, you know, I'll just say to you, well, shush, I, I'm in pain. To be in pain is to be in pain, regardless of what's happening in my C fibers. And, you know, you get examples of phantom pain of people who have lost limbs and stuff, they're in genuine pain. And even though they don't have a limb there for them to be in pain. And that's, I think that's an example of, you know, high consciousness. We just have to take it as it is, as a, you know, first person subjective state. And that, me that means that it's irreducible to objective scientific um, definition and explanation. I think the interesting point here is that it, how, do we, how do we do an ontology um, on, on, the, on the basis of that? Um, do we read off an ontology from that? Or do we say, look, this is made plausible on a basis of a, an ontology that we're already committed to, such as Aristotelian hylomorphism or something uh -huh. like that, that, you know, on a hylomorphic view, we can accommodate, you know, the first person subjectivity of consciousness. So rather than, you know, reading an ontology off of the subjectivity of consciousness, just incorporating that subjectivity within an ontology that we already have. What, what, what do you think of that? Well, what, what do you recommend between those options? Well, I mean, I, I go for the Aristotelian view that um, I think we need a, an account of uh, the being of things. 
before we start um, investigating features of the beings that we have. And so included in a, an account of the being of things, I think we need to give an a, account of, um, you know, the human being before we yeah. go into, you know, what it, how do we explain the nature of consciousness then? If we already have a metaphysics of what it is to be human, then our whole account of consciousness can just slide right into that and fit in. And then we avoid all the sort of funny negative dualisms that are out there. Okay. Yeah, I think I see what you mean. Yeah. So I think my approach would be to think of different hypotheses. And so the Aristotelian account would be a hypothesis, right? Um, and then I'm just looking for the hypothesis that would best account for the data mm. um, of, of experiences. Mm. So, and I, I don't think that the view that I arrive at, see, this is one of those things where when we're talking about this sort of the Thomism and these different arguments for an ultimate reality, mm. uh, a supreme reality, it's, I think that it's interesting to how we have maybe different approaches that sort of arrive at a sort of structurally similar mm. thing, but we might label them differently. So mm. I'm not opposed to a kind of Aristotelian label. Um, mm. I, the terms that I would use would be, I would say that there's me. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's also you, you know, so I'll give you that. There's not just me. Mm -hmm. um, and then the kind of being that you are, I'm going to assume is the same as the kind of being that I am. And well, what is that kind of being? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the kind of being that can have first person experiential properties that mm -hmm. has value. And I'm going to, you know, that has thoughts. I'm going to go through the list of features mm -hmm. as a way of characterizing the being. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that will leave open other questions, but of course there are many questions you can ask about persons, right? And I think different hypotheses are actually addressing different questions. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes there's sort of this tendency in the philosophy of mind. I noticed this when I was in graduate school to have sort of your standard set of views. Uh, and then you try to figure out which view is correct and you argue for and against these views. And then maybe mm -hmm. somebody comes up with this kind of interesting hybrid or extra view. But then it's interesting because as I started teaching in the philosophy of mind and I was taking those existing categories and maybe even coming up with some new ones and just relaying them to students, as I actually had conversations with students, I think it kind of started to break my own frame of categorizing the views because I realized that, well, those views maybe answer certain questions, but my students are asking other questions. And so mm. what do you call a view that answers these questions, but not those questions? Mm. And so I kind of just like started over, you know, like, <laughs> let me just start over. Let's get all the pieces out and, and just build from scratch. Um, mm. Yeah. That's really interesting that you mentioned that because I don't think that's just philosophy of mind. I think that's almost every branch of philosophy that, you know, you're taught it with these different categories and it's always opposing categories. And so you come to think of it that way. And yeah. then when you have to come to teach it yourself, you notice that, well, I mean, things are a wee bit more fine grained here and yeah. that you can appreciate insights from widely diverging philosophers and right. my, my approach i mean as it's developed has been to treat each philosopher individually rather yeah. than to just mm. think about an ism and to categorize philosophers and with that ism so if i'm you know engaging mm -hmm. with carnap or quine um you know, I'll engage with them as individuals and not try to sort of lump them under a common view. Well, it'd be difficult to do that with mm -hmm. them too, but Carnap and Air, let's say, you know, I'll, I'll see what's individual about them and sort of tease that out. And that's, I mean, the way I've come to sort of engage with students is to try and encourage students to do that rather than yeah. think in terms of these broad categories. Mm -hmm. So not just philosophy of mind that happens in, it's, I think it's nearly every branch of philosophy we do that. Well, that's um, I I really appreciate both of what you're saying here, and it comes down yeah to to the isms and where it can be unhelpful. Um, you know, I I guess I sometimes would, would call myself I'm like broadly a, a Thomist, and the reason I say that is for a lot of what you two have just said is, you know, sometimes I'll find a philosopher that that I think is is right or really resonates me, like a Lonergan or a Maritan on certain things, and somebody like, well, if you go with Maritan, he's against Garrigou, and now you're not a Thomist. I'm like. Mm. I'm out of the club. I'm out of the club. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Like, and like, yeah, I just don't think that's helpful. Right. In, in, mm -hmm. many, in many respects. And there's mm -hmm. a lot that I like in Garrigou, but on certain issues, yeah, I would probably go with Lonergan or, or Maritan, but then other, you know, other Lonergan of, of himself would say, well, I'm being true to Aquinas. And then you kind of get into these exe exegetical historical debates where me, I've always just been interested in what's what's what seems right what seems yeah, what, what true, true. Yeah. and then if mm -hmm. if if this label if 
if people find this label acceptable to me or whatever, I'm, fi I'm fine. If not, they can, they can get rid of it. And of course I have huge admiration for uh, Thomas, just as I have huge admiration for both of you two. And I read Josh's stuff. I'm like, wow, a lot of this seems really right and true. And I read Gavin's stuff. A lot of this seems really right and true. What does that make me? I have no idea. A Rasmussenian. That's <laughs> a Karasmussenian. A, 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 a How about that? That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's very good. Okay. I, I, if you guys have to split it anytime, I totally get it. But jo let's just say from here, um, whatever else we want to say about, um, our, our model or categories of consciousness. Josh, what do you think is, uh, how do we start to bridge the gap that we set out of this, uh, the beginning of this conversation? Uh, once we start thinking about consciousness and the ways that we have and the foundation of reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so very briefly, uh, I like to sort of think of a probability problem and a construction problem. So a probability problem is a problem of sort of predicting with any non-negligible probability that there'd be beings like us who can have an interesting conversation like this, who can think and wonder and reflect, have emotions and, and have adventures. Uh, you know, we can imagine a mindless world with particles that scatter about. And we, we might even imagine with enough particles that through random chance, they produce machines that evolve to produce complex beings that look just like us, but don't have any feelings, right? No thoughts, um, no power to choose. And so it doesn't look to me that a purely mindless theory of the foundation of the first cause or the ultimate cause is going to predict conscious beings. It doesn't have that kind of predictive resource. Uh, whereas if that fundamental reality, you shave off those arbitrary limits, it's got a supreme nature. So it's got power to produce the rest of the world, but its power is not arbitrarily limited. It's got supreme power, which I think conceptually is going to include the power of conscious uh, production, because that's a possible power that would be, I think, included in, in supreme power. And this gives it predictive resources. It explains, I mean, if it, if it has the power, if it's, a, if it's truly supreme, it doesn't have any arbitrary limits, I think it would have knowledge of good reasons to produce an interesting world where beings can come into adventures and relationships. So that's one, there's the, the prediction problem I think theism provides resources for helping with that problem uh, better than its competitors. People have to sort of investigate that on their own, you know, test that out, see if that makes sense. Then there's this construction problem, which is the problem. This is basically what Chalmers calls the hard problem of consciousness. David Chalmers is talking about how do you actually take some mindless Legos, put them together to produce not just a robot that acts like it's finding something funny, but it's literally having that feeling, you know, Gavin, you mentioned what it's like to be a bat. Like it's having the feeling of what it's like to find something funny, merely describing its shape, its geometry, its function, all that stuff doesn't seem to include that experiential element. And, and, and so the, the question is like, how in principle is it possible to construct first person consciousness? And here, I think theism provides resources for that. Now I want to be careful. Um, I don't want to be overly dogmatic here and say, well, there's no other possible way of constructing this. Uh, one of the things I do in the book is I, I focus on a very clear case of a plate. I might change the example. Right now I've written about a plate and I say, you paint that plate red. And then you ask, is that plate uh, happy now? Does the redness of the plate make you happy? And I consider different theories. Well, maybe redness is happiness, the identity theory, uh, or maybe redness determines or grounds or causes happiness to emerge, right? And I, and I consider that and I say, well, it seems like we actually don't think a red plate is happy. And well, why don't we think? I mean, you can't say the reason you don't think a red plate is happy is because it tells you that it's not happy. Maybe it is happy, it just has no vocal cords to tell you about its happiness. H how could you rule that out? And yet you seem so sure that the red plate isn't happy, why? And I would argue it's because you actually have a faculty. This isn't just introspection. It's, I would call this reason that you can see that redness is not the right material for happiness. And I start with that because I, I think it's, it is a clear case. And then once you start with that, you start moving through all the colors. Uh, you know, th does making it blue make it happy? No, blue makes it sad, right? Because it's blue. No, it doesn't, it doesn't become sad. You put, a, you put a sad face into the plate. You draw a sad face. No, it, that, the shapes don't make it sad. 
And uh, as far as I can tell, these differences in shape and color, you can actually see that they're not relevant differences. Differences in shape and color. Differences in function. Function is just a set of ordered um, uh, inputs and outputs. And so you go from an input shape to an output shape. It starts red, it becomes blue. Does that make the, the plate happy? No, I think you can see that. And making it more complex, and, and this is where it, it takes work. You have to put your mind into this, do the work of thinking about it, check, does it seem true that merely making the number of plates go up or, or the, the complexity of the shape go up or the complexity of the function go up, would that make a difference? And, and then if not, well, then it looks like you, you do have a very deep puzzle for how you could ever construct consciousness purely from third person material resources. It's tricky because people say, well, look at brains. Brains produce consciousness. It's like, okay, brains belong to conscious beings. So if you already have a conscious being there or being that has the capacity for consciousness, then, it, then you don't have the same problem because then changes to the, to the structure can affect changes to the being that's already able to be conscious. But the whole question is how do you get beings that can be conscious from scratch in the first place? It's not a question that you can sort of answer in this scientific way um, because it, any answer you give scientifically is going to presuppose this deeper construction question about how in principle it's possible. Yeah, jo Josh, um... Before um, we get Gavin's thoughts, I'm just curious um, because like how much of this is just something that you just need to like stare at intellectually until you think maybe the scales fall from your eyes. You know, you know what I mean? And because you, you, like this, this happened to me and it's just like, okay, if, if whatever else reality is, if at bottom, it's just some fundamental, physical, simple collection of disparate things that have uh, no, um, intentionality, <laughs> no uh, awareness, um, it, it, all these qualitative aspects that we associate with consciousness. It's not there, right? And, and it doesn't and, even have the power to be conscious or the power, it doesn't even have the, doesn't even have the capacity for awareness. Right, and then, yeah. okay, and then we can multiply those things. We can organize those things. We can put them in different configurations, different locations, and somehow they, almost invert into their complete and perfect qualitative opposite. I don't know how else to, to say that I think that that's impossible. Like that just, that just really does seem impossible to me. It can just <laughs> click for you. Yeah. And right, I want to be yeah. careful here because. No, and, and again, I don't want to say like you're an idiot if you don't see that. Like no, that's no. not what well, I'm saying. And, and there's a kind of reverse. There's, you know, mm -hmm. the, the problem isn't just a qualitative leap, right? Because mm -hmm. um, we do have this experience of as a conscious being, okay, I can form a mental image in my mind. And that mental image is qualitatively different than me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now th this, this, bear with me here. Um, or, you know, or if I form a thought, that thought you might say is qualitatively different than me. Or if you imagine God creating matter. Okay. You might think, well, the material world is qualitatively different than God. So how did you go from the leap from the qualitative to this different thing? And, and what I hear you saying, Pat, is not that there's an in principle problem with, creating qualitatively different things. It's that when you think specifically about these particular leaps, these particular categories, the particular right. categories from the mindless beads hitting each other or fields or whatever to produce conscious, rational. It's not even just that it's conscious. Like in some cases, our thoughts are even rational, right? But they're based on mindless, non-rational causes. It's like, there's something about that, that it can just sort of click for you and you say, no, that doesn't yeah. seem... And then, not only it doesn't seem probable, like it doesn't maybe even seem possible. At all. Yeah, I agree. And then with what you're saying, just to summarize your argument. And then with, with theism, if we think of God as just like the full plenitude of existence itself, uh, even the matter thing, again, like how do you define matter, right? If you think of yeah. matter as just a, a principle of individualization and limitation, well, yeah. then if you think of God kind of thinking of the world and he, and he thinks, well, this exists and is like me, but in this finite way, and this exists and is like me in this particular restricted mm -hmm. way, then we just have god the fullness and then a bunch of minuses right yeah just a bunch of <laughs> a bunch of subtractions right and that that doesn't seem impossible to me right um anyway gavin your thoughts on all this <laughs> um just just what you were saying there at the end that you know with uh, god's production of things you, it's, you have god and just a bunch of minuses again a very platonic sort of way of thinking and the idea that you know 
reality creation is just some sort of lesser sort of participation within you know the fullness which is the divinity again that's that platonic theme that runs through it mm -hmm. but with regard to the philosophy of mind um i think that a lot of these discussions are captivated by um a presupposition of atomism and the, the idea here is that substances are constructed out of atoms so that a uh, substance is nothing more than just an aggregate of atoms and i mean the history of philosophy of science the, the whole problem here was that of emergence you know, how is it that a substance has, you know, these properties that its atomic components don't have? And that's never really sort of in the scientific community. The only way that that was addressed was, well, let's talk about molecular properties then. So our atoms sort of bunch together and, you know, they show molecular behavior and, you know, molecules exhibit properties that the atoms, you know, the, the, their atoms don't possess. But that doesn't really sort of answer the metaphysical question, the, the problem of emergence. And um, I mean, even Leibniz realized that this was a problem and he had to sort of revert to some sort of notion of a, a primary unifying atom, which gives us, you know, these emergent properties. And in that, he was trying to get back to Aristotle's notion of substantial form. And it seems to me that unless you have an account of that, that there are formal features of a thing um, and there are features that a thing possesses, not in virtue of its material components, but in virtue of it, the material components coming to be unified in that way, such as water being, you know, H2O, um, the, the, the form that the hydrogen and oxygen take so as to produce water so that water is wet and, you know, um, can put out fire and so on, but hydrogen and oxygen themselves can't do that. Unless you have a, an account of formal properties, um, I don't think you're going to be able to answer the problem of emergence. So when it comes to consciousness then, if you have an account of formal properties, consciousness is a formal property of a material substance and not just a constructed or emergent property um, of the thing. And if it's a formal property, then the form, or as the Aristotelians say, the substantial form of the thing, um, if it's a formal property, it's immaterial, then the form itself, which supports that property, has to be immaterial. And so it can't occur as a result of transformations of matter, it has to have a direct creation. Uh, it has to be directly created by God uh, and not just wrought out of, you know, the interactions of matter. So I think, I mean, that's the sort of view that I would take. And I think it consists well with Josh's view there, because from what I'm hearing from Josh is that in order to have consciousness, there is required some sort of, you know, being, you know, like God that produces consciousness. And it's not just the result of uh, material interactions. How's yeah, that, Josh? How's that? Yeah, sound? yeah, no, that, that sounds right to me. I'm, I'm actually kind of curious. What do you think about the production of matter? Do you think that consciousness can produce matter? Or what, what do you think about Pat's idea about matter being more like limitations in the divine substance or the divine being? Um, I, I, I think... I think God can produce matter. Um, I think the production of matter is simply uh, an act of omnipotence. Um, okay. I, I don't think there's any sort of uh, root or imitation in God of matter. I mean, you know the way things sort of imitate, you know, God's divine ideas. Every individual is an imitation of that. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything like that in God. So I, I, I think... Because matter is a principle of potency and God is pure actuality, the production of matter then requires an act of omnipotence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I mean, what, yeah. No, I was just going to say, I think sometimes maybe when people think of, uh, um, you know, consciousness relating to God, um, I guess maybe they, uh, I want to be careful here because there's obviously nuances to different schools of thought, right? That if God is just kind of a mind like we are a mind, you could see, okay, well, that seems difficult then to get matter in the kind of scientific materialism idea that we have matter. It does seem like we have a leap there, but I think there's a, a different paradigm that we're all kind of looking at this through where, well, God is just whatever else God, he's the fullness of existence as such. And now we're thinking of matter as, and, and you know, whatever else the fullness of existence as such is, it could, uh, it, it doesn't seem like there's an issue with God setting out restrictions right 
of saying, uh, and if you think of matter as just kind of this, this boundedness, these, this principle of individualization or limitation or whatever. Now, I think that requires that maybe you have to have independent arguments for that type of paradigm shift. But for me, that seems, that seems, uh, it seems independently motivated, but it also seems just like more natural and, and intuitive than the kind of like just big idealism, if that makes sense. I don't know if that's yeah. kind of what you're getting at, Josh. Or... I'm trying to escape this light. It's the sort of following me <laughs> around here. Um, but yeah, I know that, that I feel like that's very helpful. I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking about is the way in which uh, mind precedes matter and that material forms um, can come from mind, emerge from mind. But then this leads to this question like, well, what is matter? I mean, it's, it's sort of interesting because it seems to me that I'm most familiar with consciousness, it, my experiences, mental imagery, um, thoughts and things like this. And then matter is kind of like this posit that is to explain my experiences. So I sort of imagine that there's this stuff out there that has these causal powers or whatever. And if I don't fill in what that is, and I just sort of treat it as a kind of functional device that can explain my experiences, well, then it leaves open a wide range of theories. And so I would sort of follow reason where it leads. I mean, if it looks like there's a theory of matter on which there's a problem for how mind could produce matter, um, well, then since it seems like my mind is related to the external world in some way, then that will just shave off that theory of matter. Hmm. Whereas if we go in the other direction and we start with sort of mindless things producing mind um, here. I think I'm, I'm more aware, like I have direct awareness of consciousness mm -hmm. and of thoughts. And, mm -hmm. and so then this is what kind of leads to that sort of construction problem um, where I'm going to say, well, I, I just don't, I just don't think you can get mind reasoning, rational thought, consciousness yeah. from purely mindless foundations. Mm. Let me say what I think the great value and overarching theme of this conversation is, and this has really been wonderful guys. I can't thank you enough so far as that we have two very, um, very um, intelligent people here who who have different procedures. I think I think it'd be fair to say that you guys have kind of different procedures in a way. Um, and there may have along the way seem to be to be points of uh, of discord, but they seem to be mostly superficial discord. And what we find is is that different procedures can uh, illuminate each other in many ways, and very interestingly, they seem to converge upon upon a, a much deeper harmony that's that's what struck me about this conversation so far um in a in a uh, and i think that's awesome i think that's that's really cool i'd just love to get your guys maybe summary or um any other anything else you want to throw out there i mean i could chat with you guys all night but it's already past midnight of gavin and <laughs> josh i know you've got a family to tend to so yeah, yeah this has been wonderful it's been mm -hmm. fun and yeah i feel like there's a kind of a theme where when there's tension it creates opportunity for greater insight. Mm -hmm. and, and I've even thought like the more tension, the more the opportunity. Mm -hmm. It seems like in marriages are sort of like this. It's like my friends where there's the most fire uh, and tension in their marriage. It seems like when they work through that tension, they have like the mm -hmm. most passionate relationships. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there's something about worldview development that's like that, you know, where if you have a question and you get some people together and they look at the question with different tools from different angles and there's a there's some tension there i think it does create an opportunity for for more insight and i, I certainly feel like that um mm. took place in this conversation cool. mm. gavin any uh summary final thoughts here and then before we go i definitely want to hear about the current projects you both are working on yeah i suppose my mo in philosophy has always been to just read everything and try and situate myself in it uh in my own thoughts um I've always been very impressed by, you know, the scholastic method of just, you know, objections, replies and trying to take what's best and everything. And, and Gilson's point that um, in philosophy, it's not a case of, you know, the true and the false and the contrast between those. It's the key, it's a case of the contrast between the more or the less true. So I think convergence is inevitable in philosophy. And especially if we've arrived at the truth of the matter, it can't be the case that, you know, discord is anything more than superficial. Um, and so I think we kind of see in that come out, given our different sort of intuitions about uh, how we arrive at God, God, you know, God and creation, um, mind and world. Um, there, there are various intuitions and moves that we're sort of making here, which uh, seem to mimic each other. And we're trying to arrive 
uh, at the same sort of end point. Um, uh, me with my sort of scholastic, you know, Kantian infused scholasticism, she would call it. And, um, you know, jo Josh and his, his own procedures where we seem to be come aim aiming at the same target, uh, but in different ways. And, you know, it's, it's been highlighted in the various convergences uh, that we've had, which is, you know, it's cool to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. All right. So let's uh, let's finish with this, which are further resources. Josh, you've got a very cool new project that you're launching um, so please take as much time as you want to, uh, to announce this, let people know what it's all about and how they can get involved. Yeah, sure. So my wife and I, we started this group called the worldview design training center. It's for anybody who's sort of obsessed with, uh, trying to understand the sort of the big questions of life. And we made this for Christians. It's, it's a resource for Christians to connect with Christian philosophers, ministry leaders, uh, public influencers who um, are really thinking a lot about the existence of God, the nature of God. Um, and it's kind of like we're all there together having conversations to help each other see more, to, un to expand our understanding. Um, and, and I've had a lot of people come in and, and find that it's a resource that provides them encouragement. Um, one of the things I'm working on now is to create a video lecture course. Um, and there are other philosophers in there who are interested in making video lecture courses for people in the group. So if you, yeah, if anybody's interested in that, go to worldview-design.com and you can mm -hmm. find out more about that. I will link it in the show notes and Josh is underselling it friends. It is, an, uh, I got a, the privilege of an early peak and it is an incredible community with really awesome discussion. So if you've made it to the end of this conversation, that is something you definitely, definitely want to check out. Gavin, uh, you've mm. always got a ton in the pipeline. What are you currently working on and should people be keeping an eye out for? Yes, yeah, so I've got, I've got a load of articles in submission at the minute. I've kind of had a bit of a flurry act of activity recently. Um, but um, I've been working on um, an article on the fourth way, an article on the first way, an article on the third way. They're all, you know, well underway, nearly finished. Um, I've got an article that um, I'm working on, on on tacit knowledge and God. So tacit knowledge is this idea that, you know, whenever you do things uh, sort of exper expertly, um, you do it by means of tacit knowledge. So you, you do it knowingly because you're an expert at it, but you don't do it sort of, you know, reflectively, uh, consciously, but you're still deploying knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm constructing a, an account of God's knowledge, which, you know, maintains that God's knowledge is more like tacit knowledge rather than our more self-reflective, you know, knowing that P is the case or something like that. Um, so I'm working on that. I'm also writing a, um, you know, a book with a co-author um, on the five ways. Um, speaking to my co-author here, Pat. So we're writing a book on the five ways together, a nice introductory text on that. So that's being written. And, um, you know, so over the course of the year, that's going to be done. And my book on the resurrection, um, I've uh, sort of made the decision to, in to incorporate the material that I've been writing on the resurrection into a larger study of Aquinas's natural theology as a whole, and Aquinas's defense of um, classical theism, even though I've just repudiated, you know, the, the notion that we can have classical theism. So <laughs> The material on the resurrection, um, it's just made more sense, you know, to precede it just with a study of Aquinas' classical theism, you know, of his natural theology, a defense of that, and then how the, how, how the whole account of the resurrection, you know, as, you know, the perfection of man and thus the perfection of creation kind of crowns all of Thomas's natural theology. So that's morphed in now into this larger project, um, which I'm working on, um, but, you know, getting a lot of traction in that. Um, and then we've got this big conference. Well, we've got a conference coming up at St. Patrick's um, on the future of Christian metaphysics. That's at the end of April. So we've got Jennifer Martin, John Betts, Lorella Conjuncti, and Tim Paul um, all speaking at that with um, responses. And then we've got our huge conference in 2022 with all of our big thinkers, you know, Patrick Lee, Robert George, Eleanor Stump, Julia Klima, you know, all, all those, you know, big names. Um, they're going to be at St. Patrick's next year. Very so... Cool. That's what I've got ahead of me. Oh, and the, yeah, and I'm teaching several courses this year at St. Patrick's undergrad and postgrad. So staying busy. 
Awesome. Well, I want to thank you again to both so much. This is this has just been an awesome time. We're gonna have a big show notes page, so we'll we'll link the Josh's resources and websites over there. We'll link Gavin's stuff, and I'm gonna link a bunch of previous conversations I had both with Gavin and Josh before. And I would encourage the listeners go and listen to the different procedures and the separate conversations, but look out for the convergence, and I think you'll find a a lot of cool stuff there. So, gentlemen, thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you. It was great.